Okay, this is the lecture for the glazing paint painting that you guys are going to work on and um, I want to talk a little bit about it. Glazing is basically a term that some people kind of imbue with all this like um, feeling of it being a, something really extensive and fancy and like very mysterious and there are parts of it that are kind of that can definitely be like that but essentially all it is is using transparent color to finish a painting um, or to build accents within a painting. So how much or how little you use it is really dependent on the style of glazing that you're doing um, and what you really need to accomplish with the painting. Rembrandt, this is a painting by Rembrandt right here, he's very well known for using glazing within his paintings. You can see that there are areas of this that are very highly finished and he was um, definitely used like some kinds of techniques that we think of with glazing in some of these areas. You can also see that there are other areas where it's underpainting and all it is is glazed with transparent color over it, a little bit of heightening of shadows, um, and then a little bit of working back in with whites and so on to hit some of this reflected light, light off the back. Um, this is another painting by Rembrandt that really has some beautiful detail and stuff to it and it shows so many different like um, resolutions of how finished it is and how much the glazing is used in different areas. Uh, it's just kind of amazing because here you see all the way down to the bottom um, canvas essentially uh, with very little done to it and yet when we look at this finished painting here we don't like look at that and go well that whole part wasn't painted. Um, and then we've got other areas where he's worked in like a tint, it looks like a tint of raw umber into this and the tint and the raw umber have some opacity to them and so they become almost like this smokiness that happens around even within the shadow you can kind of see that happening and then you can see other areas such as within the figure here that are really highly rendered you can understand why glazing might be something very important um, and something that's really helpful because when you look at something like this you can see that it's very extensive as far as the detail and um, really reflects like a lot of complexity as far as the color and the depth of um, light and shadow within there and that if you had to paint this all with just straight paint that could be really difficult to keep like your yellows clean so they don't feel like they get cold and um, keep your um, silver areas what you want get the reds in here but if you use a monochromatic underpainting and then build on top of this in layers it's really easy to control those colors and to keep them from getting cold or muddy or whatever it is that you're worried about. And just look at some more paintings you can kind of see um, something like this would probably be a lot easier to paint initially monochromatically or with a very limited palette and then to come in with glazing and heighten where you want things to be a little bit more yellow and so on but by glazing on top you also retain a lot of the properties of light and shadow that you were able to build up in the underpainting. This is a painting by De Sarto and you can kind of see the thinness of the glaze here in the shadow side of the face and yet the opacity that's built into the light side and this is um, a lot of us now we would look at something like this and go well that's unfinished I got to come in and finish all this side too but it was really common within a lot of the Baroque painters especially to let things like that happen. As we look at, these are um, contemporary artist paintings, you can see that a lot of this like delicate color and so on might be really a lot easier to accomplish by laying it in in layers. So here shows the, um, this is a beginning image of the painting where it's blocked in and it's done very monochromatically and you can see that it's become just a little bit more painted into here. The lights are starting to develop and over here we've got some of the color starting to develop as well. Guess I better plug this thing in. Um, this underpainting right here is basically one that's done in a wet ground. So the wet ground it looks like it might be a raw umber here. It's really thin and wiped out. In some places it's got a little bit more brown of the umber in some of these and then the white is worked into that wet ground underneath and um, by adding in that white into the ground it picks up some of the color of that underlying ground and it allows you to really delicately build up value and so on in it which is it can be a, a really nice um, 
effect all on its own, but it also allows you to really build up a nice underpainting that you can put color on afterwards. These are just some more works um, by another artist as well. And then this is a finished piece by that same artist. And so you can kind of see how rich these paintings can get as you build up all of these colors. Really beautifully done. His work is really beautiful. So there are different types of painting. These are just a few that we'll talk about. Impasto painting is a thick textured paint. Opaque painting is typically like very flat and it's a very even paint. It's very highly rendered um, is kind of the way we think of it. Um, glazing techniques, as we start getting into transparent color, um, using like glazing at varying degrees, we think of like semi-opaque and slightly transparent paints. Um, you'll, I actually mention this a little bit in my next um, video when I talk about using cobalt blue. I really like cobalt blue. It's actually a semi-opaque color. It's not totally transparent, but I love the way it kind of smokes in and makes these smoky blue shadows and so on. Um, and nice accents, especially in skin tones. Um, Semi-transparent and then fully transparent paint. This is an example of an impasto painting. Very thick. It's very immediate. Whatever you see in that top layer, that's what you get. And this is kind of a close-up of another painting that's got that very thick, very brush strokes. So this is kind of what we think of when we think of impasto paint. This is one by Jenny Seville. And again, you can kind of see the texture of the brush strokes, the thickness, almost like the feeling of like palette knife marks and so on, and the roughness of it. Um, some variations within glazing. We've got, there's way more than this, okay? But what we're going to talk a little bit about in this is traditional glazing, a uh, velatura glazing, and then a scumbling. Um, a traditional glaze is basically the idea of just transparent pigment. It's diluted with a medium of some sort. The color traditionally becomes warmer when you do that. Um, these are ideas of traditional glazing that I usually represent um, to the classes to talk about. This is another one. So essentially the artist does like basically a, a fairly monochromatic painting underneath. And that monochromatic painting is going to be fairly cool in nature because it's going to be with um, very desaturated like grays or browns, sometimes greens. It depends on the methods that you're using. And then um, you warm it up and you add these glazes on top to get, like in this case, the skin tones and the warmth of the light onto it. Um, this is one that uses it in a little bit different way, but very similar as well, very monochromatic almost grayscale, and you can see they're starting to put the color into some of these areas here, and it's being done very carefully. And you'll notice as I show you the next slide how this painting starts to really resolve itself. There's a lot of detail that's added into it, like the roses. You can see the flowers and so on on top are not in at this point, and that they start to be painted in more and more as, um, as they're going. So he's got like real flowers hanging here as references and he's building out a lot more of that detail, the detail of like the hair, the features and so on. It's all starting to be resolved a little bit more with these top paintings. This is another one by the same artist. A velatura glaze is a glaze with a color which is lighter in value than the underlayer and is semi-transparent. It has white in it and this will cool off the, the color. So this is a Rembrandt painting right here, one of my favorites. And this is basically what we would think of as a velatura right here, where he smoked in probably some like cremnants or lead white into his um, glaze layer that's more uh, probably umber toned or something like that. And he's slowly moving that in and letting it fade out. So it cools it down here. This is more the warmth of the glaze on top of the underpainting on the canvas. Um, this is more of the cooler version of it. Here's a close-up where you can see what I mean about how the way it cools it off and comes in there very smoky and cloudy. Scumbling is an opaque kind of glazing. It's produced by loosely dry brushing one color over another so that the under color shows through. This is used a lot with um, like murals, with acrylic painters, um, especially on large-scale murals. Uh, when it's really difficult to blend on a large-scale mural if you're working more with brushwork, scumbling a color on top is one way of optically blending 
Um, so there's no set rule here for temperature change because it really depends on what you're using for your underpainting and what you're using for the top. But generally, if the value of the pigment is lighter than the underlayer, it will have a cooling effect. If it's darker, it will have a warming effect. Um, this is an example, just a quick example from the internet of a scumbled, a blue layer scumbled on top of a red. So you can see how this will cool it off. Um, this shows scumbling within more of a, um, uh, sorry, an oil painting where you've kind of scumbled and let it kind of fade it off here with a dry brush. Some terms, and there's a lot more than this, okay, but some terms in glazing. We might look at things such as the initial drawing or studies. The imprimatur layer is a traditionally prepared canvas. It has a tone in it, and then you paint into it while it's wet. That's kind of like that one that I spoke about with the raw umber. Um, in the Verdaccio technique, there's a layer called the Piembura layer, which is uh, basically you're painting into the prim imprimatura layer with white, and you develop um, that to a finished monochromatic painting. The Verdaccio layer is the temperature variations between blue, greens, and reds, and it use, it's used to establish cools and warms. Um, a velatura is a thin layer of opaque paint. It's spread so it feels milky or cloudy. That's kind of like what we were talking about with the clouds and so on in the Rembrandt. Um, we might talk about a final glaze layer. That's basically where we're establishing, establishing the exact color notes and the relationship of the subject to the ground. A lot of times glazing is used as accents as well, and that's kind of where I would think of it being in this, um, where you might glaze in an area and then put some accents of color where you want to um, create a little bit more color subtlety or um, complexity. This is an example of an imprimatura layer. And this is as well where very little has been worked into it yet. It's a wet ground. Um, and there's some darks and so on and a drawing that's kind of brushed into it. And then this would be the Piembura layer when you start moving in some of the whites and so on into it and really resolving some of the values within this. Um, this is the same thing right here. You can see that it really gives you some uh, very beautiful effects. These are all done by Adrian Gottlieb, and um, he's really well known for this technique. And he's the one who did some of those paintings at the beginning. The name kind of escaped me at the moment, but I've remembered it now, fortunately. And he's a very talented um, painter and does some really beautiful work. And you can see how this layer in itself could feel like a finished painting all by, it just has a real kind of ghostly effect sometimes. The Verdaccio layer, this would be a Verdaccio layer, so you can see where the cools and the warms are kind of established by the use of reds um, with some lights and then the use of some green-blue tones, basically, to hit those cools and warms. And it might feel like a finished layer to you until you look at the finished. And you can see here in the finished how it's a lot more refined. There's a lot more warmth overall within the skin tone. So if we look back at this Verdaccio layer, and then the final glaze layer where it's really completed. It's a big difference. Look at like some of these shadows, the way that the eyes and so on are developed in here, um, and just the overall warmth and the skin tones. Some typical glaze colors, these are some of them, and you guys have some of these, the Indian yellow, um, transparent orange, perylene red is one of the warm reds that works out well for a transparent red. Um, quinacridone red. Uh, the quinacridones as a whole are all really great. Um, you guys have some of the, the burnt orange, I believe, and the gold. Um, I used the burnt scarlet and the gold. Um, dioxazine purple is a good glaze color. Manganese blue is really nice. Um, phthalo blue, green, emerald, those are all nice glaze, la glaze colors. Other useful ones are indigo or Payne's gray. Those two are so similar that I don't put them usually both out. I do one or the other. Um, I believe you guys have the Payne's gray. Um, Prussian blue, uh, manganese violet, um, alizarin crimson, and which is what I believe you guys have, the manganese violet you have. Instead of Prussian blue, I think you're using the phthalo blue. Um, olive green and sap green. A lot of times I don't put those both out, but there was that green um, fabric in here, so I did use it. Um, transparent earth yellows, oranges, reds, and browns are all nice as well. 
fat over lean. All mediums are fat, all opaque pigments without medium are lean. So basically we think of like our earth pigments are usually leaner pigments. They lean, they dry more quickly. Um, the reason we want to remember this rule is archivally it makes a big difference. If you have lean pigments underneath, they dry more quickly and they dry before the fat layers that are on top of them dry and this makes the fat layers adhere a little bit better to them. It also means that the fat layers, um, they as they dry more slowly, um, it's not a problem with it. The problem is that if you do it the other way around, if you do lean over fat, the lean paint that's on the top layer will dry quickly and yet the fat layer underneath will not be dry yet. And so you'll see this sometimes with old paintings where people didn't necessarily know about this or pay attention to it if they did know about it, um, where you see cracks in the paint and those cracks come about sometimes because there was a fat, more oily layer underneath and it needed to dry, it, it continued to kind of shift a little bit as it was drying and it cracked through that lean paint on top of it that had dried. Um, you usually want to paint opaquely first with little or no medium and subsequent layers as you start moving up to higher layers you add just a little bit more oil. That oil will soak through to the first layer which is already drying and it will adhere to it and then um, it will also allow those top layers to dry more slowly so that the bottom layers dry first. Certain oils tend to yellow with time, so you definitely want to stick with refined oils. Linseed oil yellows for sure. Um, even the refined linseed oil will tend to yellow a little bit. Um, walnut oil and poppy oil are probably a little better. They're also more expensive. If you put too much solvent in your medium, it will cause your pigment to break down, which destroys the color and the texture of your painting. You never want to use more than 50% solvent. You can use it in your paint mediums, but you always want to balance it with some sort of a binder when you do it, which would be an oil. Um, you never use Damar varnish in your, v in your medium. and. There are a lot of medium mixtures that do use Damar varnish. The problem is that if it's not balanced correctly and well, it can be really destructive if somebody tries to clean it later. So the whole thing with Damar varnish is that it's really easy to lift that varnish layer that you basically put over the painting to unify all of the paint surfaces and to protect it from dirt. Well, the thing with Damar varnish is it's basically Damar crystals that are soaked in turpentine. And if you want to lift it, all you do is you use more turpentine and basically cotton and you lift and you soak the cotton with turpentine and then you can lift that Damar varnish layer off. The problem is that if you mix Damar varnish into your mediums and if you don't mix it properly with enough binders, even if you mix it and it's just an uneven mixture or anything like that, when you start trying to lift that Damar varnish layer later to clean it, clean the painting and put a fresh layer of varnish on, it'll lift some of the paint as well. This has been a real common problem for um, museum workers that are trying to restore paintings and, and protect them over time. Now, more than likely, our paintings that we're doing in this class, nobody's going to care about them 300 years from now. Okay, but the reality is that why use it when there's so many other things that you can use that work well as, and won't have this property happen? mediums. These are just different examples by different artists, okay? Um, I can't remember which one of these was which, so don't quote me on it. Um, but basically, stand oil mixed with turpentine to a desired consistency is one way of working. Another thing you can mix with stand oil is refined linseed oil. The problem that I have with this sometimes is that depending on how you use it or depending on your mixtures or what your underlying layer is, it can bead up on the surface, kind of like when water beads on glass or something. So sometimes it's a little bit hard for people to handle. Um, another medium mixture is two-thirds refined linseed oil and one-third turpentine. The turpentine helps it to thin out a little bit more and to dry more quickly. Another is one-third Venetian turpentine, which is a, it's more of a, a resin rather than a traditional turpentine is the way we think of it. Um, one third sun thickened linseed oil, which is similar to stand oil, and then one third turpentine. So basically a third of a resin, a third of an oil, and then a third of turpentine, which would be um, a uh, name went out of my head. Um, solvent, sorry. And then another one is one half sun thickened walnut oil, 
one quarter Canadian balsam, which is a resin, and then one quarter turpentine. This is the medium mixture that I think Adrian Gottlieb uses, and then I believe this is the medium mixture that um, Obnerdrum uses. These are just some examples. This is one by another artist, um, a woman that I uh, follow on Instagram. You can kind of see how, and she uses a method that's um, kind of based out of Adrian Gottlieb's work. So it's very similar. So she lays in that um, underlying layer with the whites into the wet um, ground and then starts building all of the um, details and the uh, um, initial like cools and shadows or cools and warms and then builds up to the final details. Um, this artist right here is a Russian. I believe he's Russian and he lives up actually in like Washington State or somewhere up in the Pacific Northwest and he does these paintings they look like they're all done in color but he actually does them initially monochromatically and then glazes in all of this color and I have kind of the process videos that he had put up for one of them or process I'm sorry process photos that he had put up so really beautiful the sense of color and detail and so on within them so this is one of his paintings here and this is his underpainting and it looks very similar to the same colors that we used in ours where it looks traditionally like it's using a some sort of an umber maybe a raw umber um, and then some sort of a black similar to like an ivory black and then whites and it allows you to really kind of finish everything as far as like value and get all of your initial values blocked in um, this is when he's starting to lay in some of the glaze color on top so you can see like here, if we look back at this pomegranate, he has a lot of the texture, the light and shadow on here. Then he comes in and starts playing around with the color on it. And the grapes are very simply put in at this point. Here's an apple, and you can kind of see the brush strokes. It hasn't been smoothed out yet or anything. You just get an idea of what's happening, and you can see here where it's a little bit more smoothed and refined. Oh, and the other thing is to kind of notice like how he's working some of these areas as well. And one thing I want you to notice is there's a real lack of like um, there in the final painting, you're going to see all kinds of little like insects and branches and stuff. You don't see them here, but I want to kind of point out that they're not here yet. And he leaves those final little details as things that he puts in in those final final layers. So one of the things that's really nice about a very complex area like this drapery is that if you paint it first monochromatically, you can really establish your pattern in a much simpler way. If you think about trying to paint something like this and keeping in mind your shadow and your light the whole time along with your different colors of the pattern and so on it gets so complex you kind of want to tear your hair out but if you start it off with just the shadow and light and do it monochromatically it kind of retains all your color and you can see the difference in like this area versus this there's a lot more um, refining and detail but this gives you the framework to build on top of So he even comes in and hits all these little stitches and you can see right here that they're not really in at this point, but as he keeps building, he gets them in. He um, really allows him to like build in lots of color into these areas, little details, keep a lot of the monochromatic painting showing through. Um, this is kind of coming in and just hitting the bare little bits of like these lights and so on. Here it is much more complete, really beautifully rendered. Here, this is kind of one of the de some of the details I'm talking about, the little droplets of um, water that he's done on the leaves and the flowers, the little ladybug in here. Um, you can see how the grapes are much more refined and finished at this point, and yet some areas are still very rough. Here he's going back. So he, he started out initially with just getting the reds, and the warm lights and so on and some of the cools in there then he's coming back and he's adding in all the little green details that are in there makes sense right because if you're trying to do the greens and the reds they're those are complements of each other so if they're mixing together or anything happens you touch it you're going to dirty up your colors this allows you to do it in layers where you can maintain a lot more care for some of those colors this is the painting part way through here are some details. He's added in things like the moth and so on in here. 
Um, all of these little like branches are more finished, these little grapes, another little ant. So all kinds of detail that you really don't see at this point in the underpainting. Same thing with all these little twisty branches and things like that that are coming through. The individual pomegranate seeds and so on, the drops of water. So really beautifully finished. And this pomegranate here is quite a long ways. Same thing with this apple as what we saw in those very first scenes, on the very first photos. Same thing even with these grapes. So, And now you can see like he's added in these stalks of wheat he added in these extra berries which were not in the initial underpainting at all um and then lots and lots of really fine detail in some of these areas so beautifully just beautifully handled and there's the painting once it's completely finished a lot of color kind of resonating through like what we think of as white drapery and so on these are just some student examples. So here you can see them partway done where you get some of the underpainting in them. Here it is with a little bit more color put into it. Um, this is one that's partway done. So you can see the top part here is partly finished, but a lot more to go. The bottom part, this is the underpainting that that student did. Here it is when it was completely done. So a lot more resolution to like the lights and shadows up here right um color added into all these areas a lot of really delicate color added through this shell here now the underlying painting is still there for sure but you can see like how beautiful and how soft it is these little bits of highlights like this really easy to do when you're working with glaze So some of these, you know, some nice examples in here and just a lot of different strengths and um, areas that need to be worked on, but really interesting. These were all basically grayscale paintings to start out with. Um, a lot of color put into some of these areas, a lot of complexity. So hopefully this helps you guys kind of understand like where you're going to go with this and what you want to do. Um, the glaze allows you to really um, work back in a lot of detail into what you're doing, a lot of complexity to your color, um, build up a lot of um, detail in a way that might be a little bit easier for you to handle. It's kind of the fun part of doing this painting is putting in all the glaze. It, it's work still. But you've done the hardest work, which is doing all the monochromatic stuff first. These are all great examples. A lot of really nice colors. Sometimes I think these monochromatic light objects are the funnest thing to glaze because there's so much you can do with them. I think some of these cools and warms that are happening in here are really nice. And then I thought this was handled really beautifully. I think my only... Um, complain or only thing I would say to fix is not leaving these such a stellar bright white. I would atone these as well. Um, and even if they were slightly different from the rest of the skull, I would have given them some sort of color in here and warmed them up. But this is beautifully handled as far as like the cools and the warms and so on.